What's cracking, big dopes? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the dungeon. This animal, I don't know what the fuck he was thinking, but he fucked up the fade the public sign back here. It was good. Like, we had it for, like, 45 straight weeks where it was white and the red looked good. And then he tried to get cute, and he fucked it all up. And uh, the moral of the story is don't get cute, except in Dynasty. We're getting cute today. We're looking at deeper targets. Guys that are maybe forgotten. I mean, if you're in the Dynasty leagues, you probably – um, you know, most guys are on your radar. Most guys that are even like somewhat relevant are on your radar. But last week we did some buy low, sell high kind of guys that we thought would make a big impact on your team immediately and kind of going forward. There are a lot of the bigger names. Uh, we had like Darius Geis and Terry McLaurin and guys like that that we like today. We're going to dive a little bit deeper. We're going we're gonna to look at contracts particularly. We're going to look at guys whose contracts are this year, guys who could possibly uh, retire or move teams or whatever, or some younger guys that you might have forgotten about because of injuries or whatever. So we're diving a little bit deeper for guys that when you're making moves in Dynasty, right, because if you play in Dynasty, most of the trades uh, or, or most of the moves you make on your team are trade-related. You know, you can't really hit the waiver wire too often. So with trades, it's usually multiplayers. It's usually like three, pick, uh, three guys plus a pick or two for another two or four guys or whatever. So you have a lot of end uh, end of the trade kind of roster players that are thrown in. So we're going to look at some guys today that are that are almost throw-ins on, on trades and we think could eventually like supplant that value and become legitimate flex players or starters for your dynasty teams moving forward. So um, we'll have to figure out what we want to do for next week's episode. We've been kind of bouncing around with these Wednesday videos. Uh, I think what we're going to do, no, what we decided on was we're going to look at a few of the uh, Patreon members' dynasty teams, their rosters, and kind of uh, see what they got going on and maybe make some critiques, uh, some possible trade advice or things that we would just do with their roster overall. So um, if you want us to critique your roster, I believe we're going to just pick maybe three or four rosters and go over it. But Noah said he is... Uh, he is willing to look over. If you post it on Patreon, he will give you personal advice for each of your rosters. I don't know why the fuck you would agree to do that, but he has. So, so I'm going to be head over heels going into this stuff. So you're going to no. Well, this is bullshit. You can't blame us if you fail your finals. You have to choose your priorities. You're going to give really good advice and fail your finals, or you're going to do really well in your finals, and the advice you give is shit. But if you're willing I'd to rather, roll the dice, I'd rather there, fail my finals and help somebody's roster than pass them and no. have somebody's roster go into the damn dungeon. Good. I was testing you there. So if you want to sign up, <clears throat> patreon.com slash BDGE uh, for next week's episode, throw your roster on there if you are a Patreon member. And I guess title it with um, week 15, week 15 Wednesday video or something like that. Do a title so that we'll know you're trying to enter into next week's video. Uh, as for today's video, if you enjoy, make sure you hit that thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you are new, we'll be covering fantasy football all off season and whatnot. Probably a lot of dynasty content. But for today, are we ready to go? I'm fucking out of energy already. I can't even. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. You talked a lot. I feel kind of bad that I'm just sitting here. Can't breathe. I can't breathe. Yeah, hit the fucking intro. <laughs> All right, but on a serious note, if we're talking about the LA Chargers, which we weren't, I just said that for no reason. We're talking about Justin Jackson. Now, we forgot all about Justin Jackson because of the storylines that have developed in this Chargers backfield so far in 2019. We have two separate ones. We have Austin Eckler and just how much of a beast he was at the beginning of the year and just how good he's been over the course of the year, even with Melvin Gordon back. So Justin Jackson is not only taking a backseat to Austin Eckler, but predictably to Melvin Gordon as well because he had all the drama in the beginning of the year and holding out. Plus the fact that Justin Jackson has been sidelined for most of the year. He's only appeared in four games so far with this calf issue, which is obviously serious. It was a strained calf or whatever that's led him to miss uh, the majority of the season. So he has been long forgotten. But the kid is 23 years old. He has signed through the end of next year as well. And if there's one thing that's clear, it's that the Chargers are going to produce fantasy points out of their backfield from their running backs one way or another, whether they're good or whether they're bad, and regardless of which tandem of running backs they have in their backfield. I don't even think they need to be that talented at this point. I just think they're going to produce no matter what. I was looking at numbers the other day, and the Chargers are top five in combined running back fantasy points. So if you just combine the fantasy points that a backfield has accumulated 
um, between all of their running backs. The Chargers are top five right now in 2019. And that is despite being four and eight, despite being 22nd in scoring, despite being 20th in plays per game and having the 29th slowest or 29th fastest pace in the NFL. And despite having uh, the worst fans in the NFL, uh, wow. that has all come to fruition despite all of that nonsense. The story here is that the running backs just get it done. The question becomes, who will be – don't worry, you'll have your chance to rebuttal after this, Noah. Who will be those running backs that get it done going forward? We know for sure. One thing, it ain't going to be Melvin Gordon. He is not coming back to the Chargers next year. They didn't want to get the deal done this year. I don't think it's going to happen in this offseason. He will be elsewhere. Austin Eckler, also going to be a free agent at the end of 2019. He is a re uh, restricted free agent, not an unrestricted free agent. So there is a good chance that he will be back with the Chargers. Um, but he might earn himself a fat contract elsewhere. So that's kind of up in the air. Right now, I'd say it's 50-50 that Eckler's back, even if he is back. You know, if that's the case, I would say one, like hallelujah to anyone that has Eckler in Dynasty because if they keep a tandem of Eckler and Justin Jackson, he becomes a borderline RB1 for you that kind of came out of, out of nowhere. At least he was like a borderline flex play at the beginning of the year. And that's what Jackson was. And Jackson can become, you know, really, really, really good if he becomes the, the, the one-two the two punch and the one-two punch of him and Eckler. He was just an afterthought, and he's someone that will probably have uh, an immediate double-digit touch workload because that's what we've seen. If you look at the splits um, in games from his short career that Melvin Gordon has been out, he's averaged about 10 or 11 touches a game. And this is, like I said, an offense that throws their running backs at a very high rate. They use them on the goal line a lot in the passing game. They're really good at getting their running backs in space. My only concern, my only real concern here is what happens with Anthony Lynn. Because I think if he's gone, I know they just replaced their offensive coordinator, but I think he's done a really good job from a fantasy perspective of getting his running backs in really good uh, open field situations and having them produce at a very high level. So, you know, just the lack of success that they've had as a team might mean that they might move on. But I feel like he's kind of been like a Sean Payton-esque kind of guy in terms of producing at the running back position for fantasy where he doesn't give any one running back a, a huge workload. He splits it around and he gets all of them involved in space. So I really like Justin Jackson. I'm not in love with the player. He's not like a bigger guy where he's ever going to take on a 20 touch workload, but we don't need that in this backfield because we've seen Austin Eckler produce at a high level with a 10 to 15 touch workload. And I think, you know, we could see something where both of them get, you know, 15 for Eckler and maybe 10 for Justin Jackson next year. Yeah. To your last point about Anthony Lynn being very good at getting running backs involved. If you remember, like, back before Anthony Lynn was even there, they had Mike McCoy, who is just a complete failure running the ball, yet Danny Woodhead, and I know Melvin Gordon didn't score that year, but they both put up pretty decent, like, counting numbers. So even if they move on from him, as long as they don't bring in Mike McCoy once again, um, I could see Justin Jackson, Justin Jackson playing a very similar role to what Matt Breida is doing this year, like a complement to the 1A, like playing that 1B role, getting, you know, 8 to 10 rushes a game, 2 to 4 catches, because... If you look back at his college stats at Northwestern, the guy was the definition of a workhorse. He had 250 touches every single year. He had like 20 plus receptions every year. He could do it in all facets of the game. And yeah, he's not a bigger back, but I think just the way that they've used him throughout his career to this point uh, shows how they're going to use him and like how efficient he is on those touches is going to bring fantasy value despite, you know, limited workloads. Yes. So Justin Jackson, we're all in despite the size. He's had the workload. He can handle the workload. <laughs> Uh, everyone's just down on him because of him not playing and all the other drama that's going on in the backfield. So he's someone that you can uh, throw in at the end of trades. And sorry, I wasn't really paying attention only because I was trying to bring in uh, or bring up a trade that I actually made in a dynasty league last week that included Justin Jackson. All right. So I offloaded and I thought I killed this trade. I offloaded Tyler Lockett, carry on Johnson, Devin Singletary and David Johnson. I'll send you the picture so people can get a clear uh, image in their head of it. Tyler Lockett, David Johnson, carry on Johnson, Devin Singletary. So three running backs, David, David Johnson's pretty washed. And Tyler Lockett, I got in return, Zeke, DJ Chark, and Justin Jackson. And like, obviously I'm pumped up to get Zeke and I'm pumped up to get DJ Chark. But like, I was, I was low key really excited to get Justin Jackson um, because I think like he's going to be a solid flex play next year for me. Who would you rather have like in Dynasty, David Johnson or Justin Jackson? Honest question. Oof. Uh, <laughs> Hard hitting effects. Or Derrick Henry, one of those three. I almost <laughs> – what did you say, Derrick Henry at the end? Yeah. You know, it's fun. Actually, I'll wait for the next blog to post. Uh, there's, there's something funny about Derrick Henry in it. But, I, man, I almost feel like it's getting too cute with Justin Jackson. But well, Johnson's done. David Johnson's done. I can't imagine. Like, what the fuck are they going to do with him? He's, He's signed uh, for a couple more years, I'm pretty sure, and for, like, a big dead cap hit if they cut him. So, I don't know what they can do with him. Contract, yeah. Um, 
Fuck. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go Justin Jackson, bro. If I'm, <laughs> if I'm really building a dynasty that. team right now, I think I'm going to take Justin Jackson over <laughs> David Johnson. I might be lying just because we're in the middle of talking about him, but, like, I want nothing to do with David Johnson. So I was really fucking pumped up that I got him off of my team and got, like, good, good value in return for him. So Justin Jackson, go throw him in at the, at the bottom of a trade or something. You'll be happy you did. I know, Noah, you want to stick with the, uh, the Los Angeles Chargers. There's someone else on this roster that you think we should be buying in Dynasty. Yeah, not many times can I, like, talk positively about the Chargers. Actually, very few times other than what's today's date, the 3rd of December. But I'm going to take advantage of that. We have Tyrod Taylor, and he's strictly, strictly like, a throw-in to a deal in super flex leagues because in those type of leagues in Dynasty, um, when you need to start two quarterbacks to be competitive, it's very hard to have, like, a third guy or even a fourth guy. I know in our league and probably in years, too, Scott's been, like, taking all of them. And there might be a guy in your league who just, on the startup draft, draft took like four or five starters just to screw everybody else over Tyrod Taylor is an under the radar guy that might have a job next year because one we've all seen Phil Rivers this year Phil Rivers is completely washed he cannot make a throw his every read he makes on like third and fourth and long in the fourth quarter is just a 70 yard bomb to Mike Williams that has like a 10 percent chance of completion so I'm doing in the wait hold on real quick like you mentioned Scott and his (laughs) quarter Wait, I want to show you. I want to. I want to show you or tell you something right now. I'm in a uh, dynasty league with Scott. It's a one quarterback league. Oh, no. I'm gonna list his uh, the quarterbacks on his roster right now. You ready? Lamar Jackson, Robert Griffin the third, Case Keenum, Blake Bortles, Teddy Bridgewater, Jacoby Brissett, Nick Mullins, Josh Rosen, <laughs> Chase Daniel, Kyle Allen, Kyler Murray, Will Greer, Jared Stidham, David Blount, <laughs> Tyrod Taylor, <laughs> Drew Locke. Uh, so like 20 of his 28 rosters, I have no idea what the fuck he's doing. He's own 13 in that league. I'm not, <laughs> not sure what the, the rebuild process is. I could almost pretend to make a case for him and, and make him feel a little bit better about himself. If this was a super flex league, but Scott, what the fuck are you doing in that league? Um, but at least he's, he's got, uh, Tyrod Taylor there. So we're waiting <laughs> on that break out. Sorry. I just had to interject. On yeah. That. He's in a league of mine and it's super flex and he has eight quarterbacks and he has like David Blau somehow so I don't know how he got him but um good on you Scott but yeah Tyrod Taylor the reason why I like him is he's signed through 2020 which means that there's probably a good chance they don't bring back Phil Rivers which I would not blame them he's 37 years old and he's got like 15 kids to feed so they're not gonna have the money to pay him um for him to like come back and start if they give him like two million dollars just for like they feel bad still even then I don't see him playing more than like two or three games and doing a little farewell tour uh, a la Eli Manning this year and Tyra Taylor comes in and even in the draft if they get a quarterback now they're not gonna get Joe Burrow because even though they're terrible their record isn't bad enough to be the 101 or 102 um, even if they bring in a Tua or Jalen Hurts first off Tua is hurt so he wouldn't be able to play probably any of next year and Jalen Hurts I'm not sure if he's ready to transition into the NFL yet he could sit behind Tyra Taylor and, and learn behind him because he's another guy who uh, relies what about Easton Stick for God Easton Stick low key is like Tyrod Taylor 2.0. He was I know. like that's what I'm saying. Like why why do you think they would give Tyrod Taylor the chance when Easton Stick is running fucking sub Josh Jacobs 40 yard dash? <laughs> because this team management man, you don't know what like they they may bring in like Melvin Gordon for 30 million dollars a year this season. Did uh, <laughs> uh fucking Jesus Christ. I hope not. Did, did Easton <laughs> Stick uh play at all this year? Like did he play in the preseason? Did you get to watch him at all? I think he played a little bit in the preseason. He's like a, I'm pretty sure he's a shorter guy that might be alive, but he's like he's really quick and if he's just going to like rely on short passing game, I think one, six one two twenty five. So he's built like a, a running back, but I mean that's not that's something. not like very that's not poor size for a quarterback in today's day and age. But he runs like a four six two forty yard dash. I wasn't kidding. Um, I just don't know if he he didn't really put up prolific college numbers, and he is coming out of uh, North Dakota State. So it's like you know that's not a power five conference. So that's where uh, Carson Wentz went. Yeah, I was about to say. I think that's where he went. Yeah, and he's, he's about to bust out. So, Easton Stick was a guy who had uh, around a 62% completion percentage or below that in all four years of college. Um, so, I mean, the, the numbers aren't great, but he did rush for um, over 650 rushing yards in his sophomore, junior, and senior season. Holy shit. He had 17 rushing touchdowns his senior year and 12 the year before that. So, got a rushing ability to him, but, like, that I, it just they just put themselves in a weird spot where like it, it almost seemed like they had no fucking thought of Philip Rivers being done this year. They're like, yeah, he's just gonna keep being <laughs> Philip Rivers, and it's like it's not fucking Tom Brady. So they have to move on quickly. My my thing with Tyrod is like I feel like we've seen him enough in the NFL to know that 
he's not more than like a half a season kind of quarterback at this point, you know? Yeah. And I, I agree with that too. So maybe that he's only there for a couple of games, but even then, like we saw him in Cleveland, I know he only started like two games when Baker was there. He had some decent games. It was like two again, I'll say that, but like as a throw in a deal in a super flex league, if you need somebody for a bye week and he has that potential to take over the reins next year when he's the only quarterback under contract that has NFL experience um, and the weapons that he has, right? Like in Buffalo, he was very productive, but he had like Chris Hogan and Marquise Goodwin who weren't being used a lot. Robert Woods wasn't being used a lot. Um, I know those are big name guys, but in Buffalo, those were people that weren't like really dominating snaps at all. The only guy who really was was Sammy Watkins who couldn't stay healthy. So um, I think with the weapons he has that are all under contract and then likely bringing back Hunter Henry and Austin Eckler, if he does get a chance to start next year, I could see him being like kind of like a Jacoby Brissett of this year where you didn't expect him to start, but he gave you decent value when you needed him during flex, uh, during bye weeks or as like an injury fill in. Yeah, I think that's actually my favorite part about playing in super flex dynasty leagues is when a quarterback gets hurt. And you're not even sure if you have him on your roster, but when you do, you feel like you like hit the jackpot. It's like immediately everyone goes to group me and it's like, oh, I own fucking Jeff Driscoll. Fucking <laughs> yeah. Send trades. You know what I mean? Like that's my favorite part of it. So Tyrod Taylor is, yeah, it's a guy that like, I'd love to have on my roster for a super flex league in case, you know, something comes up where he becomes a starter, which should happen, you know, at the end of this year, or at least throw Eastern stick in there or something because Philip Rivers just can't get it done at this point. Um, he's one of those guys that, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, w he's worth rostering and uh, you'll be excited about him in super flex leagues if you can get him. And he's not some, he's not someone you have to like pay up for. I think at this point, like, would you, what would you trade for Tyrod Taylor trade up? Would you trade, would you give up a, a future fourth round pick for Tyrod? I think what the difficult part is, um, is that we won't know if Philip Rivers is coming back until later in the offseason. And if you wait till after the draft, when those draft picks become inflated and you know, like the landing spots of players, I think at that point you could get him for a fourth. But if Philip Rivers isn't signed at that point, I think Tyra Taylor's price is also going to increase. So maybe a fourth won't get it done. I just feel like there's so many paths in which Tyra Taylor is not the quarterback next year. Like I'm going to ask animal when he gets out of the fucking bathroom, what over under how many games Tyra Taylor starts next year. But uh, we'll right, then ask about Joe Flacco. <laughs> oh, he's coming bike. It's it's fucking Joe Flacco come bike season next year. Put that on your mama. All right, let's let's get off of Tyrod Taylor. Let's get off of all these fucking irrelevant um, quarterbacks. Let's talk about a, a rookie. Like last year, we talked or last week, we talked about how a, a strategy of mine is to get these young wide receivers who don't produce in the rookie year because everyone's hyped up about them. They don't produce, so their value goes down a little bit. So you can buy them going into their sophomore year because they've already got that rookie season out of the way. And that's usually a year uh, on their contract in which you don't uh, expect production. It doesn't happen, so their value goes down. I'm thinking about Paris Campbell, real quick, Animal. Tyrod Taylor, over, under, how many games does he start for the Chargers next year? I'll put it at three and a half. Under. Under. You don't think he starts a game? No. Animals, animal does it, so that means 16 games. We're getting well, started. How are his picks doing this year? <laughs> <laughs> You're on board with Ethan Stick, the Stick Nader. All right, Paris fucking Campbell. The reason, I mean, I, Paris Campbell's got elite athleticism in every drill, every sense of the word. And if you bought him in Dynasty last year, like when you have rookie drafts, it's usually right after the NFL draft. Almost everyone's rookie draft for Dynasty Leagues was prior to the Andrew Luck news. So you thought you were going to have an elite athlete at the wide receiver position, you know, in tandem with Andrew Luck for the next four or five years. That obviously didn't happen. But Paris Campbell still is a guy who far outproduced Terry McLaurin uh, during their final years at Ohio State and still has – Four three speed, and he's not that small. Like you think of him as like a, a nifty slot receiver, but he's six foot, two hundred five pounds, and that's the way that we're seeing a lot of uh, really big name wide receivers. He's like slightly you know, smaller than DJ Moore, and I think their skill sets are like exactly. very comparable. Exactly, and and I mean the bigger thing here is who's going to be a free agent for the Colts next year. T.Y. Hilton is the only guy, literally the only weapon that they have returning next year. I mean, maybe they'll re-sign one or two of these guys. But here are the list of wide receiver free agents that are on the Colts right now. Devin Funches, Chester Rogers, Zach Pascal, Varese Fontaine. So, like, their top four guys after, um, after T.Y. Hilton, all free agents after this year, they're tight ends. The guys who catch the balls over the middle, where Paris Campbell will be running a lot of routes. Eric Ebron, Jack Doyle, Mo Alleycox. All three of them are free agents after this year as well. So, like, it, there is nothing there besides Paris Campbell and T.Y. Hilton so I don't see any way where Paris Campbell is not at worst the starter in three wide receiver sets. And like we've seen, I know Brissett like has not been great lately, but dude, he is arguably the worst weapon 
group in the NFL right now, what he's had over the last like three or four games. He came back from his injury and has had like three or four games where he's extremely underperformed for fantasy wise. But if you put any quarterback in that situation, you can't expect anything. He's, he's been without T.Y. Hilton. He's been without one or two of his tight ends for most of the time. He's been without Paris Campbell. He's been without Devin Funches. Like he's had Zach Pascal running as his like alpha wide receiver one for the last month or so. Anytime you have a quarterback in that position, like the point I'm getting at is, is Jacoby Brissett is not that bad when you have weapons on the, on the field for him. And all I'm saying, what, what if Andrew Luck is bite? What if he's fucking bike? I held on to him in, in my dynasty league, man. I, I think he's coming back. I think he's just a little bit burnt out. I think he's like me. He's burnt out towards the end of the season. He's like, I need to take a little break. We need to get away from it all. We're going to come back, recharge, and Andrew Luck is going to come back with a fucking vengeance next year. Paired up with Paris Campbell as the wide receiver too. Like, let's, let's make magic here. Yeah, I think Andrew Luck was a little wary of the injury bug that was going around, just looking at the weapons that, like, Indianapolis has lost this year, as you brought up. But, yeah, Paris Campbell's a guy who has that speed, and he's got decent enough size that if you haven't seen him play, you'd think that he's a redundant skill set to T.Y. Hilton, but he really isn't. In college, he played most of his uh, snaps out of the slot. And I have a stat from PFF, and this is the type of stuff you'll get in the draft guide. I pulled this straight out of there before we started recording. 75.5% of Campbell's yards came after the catch in 2018. The year prior, 89% of his yards came after the catch. So he's a guy when you get the ball in his hands, he's basically a running back. He can take a few hits. He can juke a few guys out. And I think he's very similar to uh, DJ Moore in that aspect. Like he's a guy who isn't necessarily small despite not being tall um, just because he's a thicker frame and he can really win after the catch. And we've seen DJ Moore with a not so great Kyle Allen at the helm produce just because he's electric with the ball in his hands. And even if Jacoby Brissett, doesn't ever return to the form he had early in 2019, which I think is highly unlikely because of all the factors that went into his play declining. Um, even if he doesn't like regain that footing, Paris Campbell is a guy that you don't really need to like throw a deep ball to and he has to win a contested situation. You can draw up screen plays for him and he'll produce. So a guy with his draft pedigree and his production in college and his athletic measurables and that second year leap that everybody talks about and it keeps happening year after year, he's definitely going to be a breakout candidate next season and a guy who can really rack up a bunch of catches. I think his last year at Ohio State, he had like 90 receptions with Dwayne Haskins. He could be like a very good PPR threat next season. Yeah, I hope that I mean, he's probably very close to returning. He's missed, missed, I think, the last month of the season. I almost hope he doesn't come back because if he comes back, since there's no weapons really there, I'm expecting T.Y. Hilton to get shut down for the rest of the year. Like he'll probably have one or two big games and people will kind of remember him. The only problem with guys like Paris Campbell and trading for them, it's very hard to trade low because Whoever drafts a guy like Paris Campbell is obviously very sold on him as an athlete, right? And he's not going to give him up for free. Um, but I just think, like, his value has to be way lower now than it was at the beginning of the year. So if there's a buy window for it, it's right now, probably before the end of the season, because, like I just said, he'll probably be back. And since there's no one else to catch balls there, like, Funches is not back. T.Y. Hilton's out. Um, the, the tight end, Eric Ebron's out. So, like, they'll probably, if he does get back for three regular season games, he'll probably have one or two good games, and that will obviously boost his value a little bit. So, Paris Campbell's a guy that I'm definitely um, looking to target in the offseason if you can get him at a discount price. Yeah, and just talking about, like, rookie drafts, right? Last year, he was a consensus, like, top six or seven pick. Like, the only guys I can think of that were, like, definitively, definitively ahead of him were, like, Nikhil Harry, uh, the three running backs, and maybe A.J. Brown. Other than that, yeah. he was in that conversation. Right now, and even after like the combine and all that stuff, I'm sure you could get him straight up for a second round pick. And I know this is supposed to be like a deeper class, but Paris Campbell was basically like a no miss prospect coming out of Ohio State. And the fact that his value will likely fall that far provides a great buy low window for him. Yeah, you know what we should you know what we should do at the end of the season in one of the videos is redo a rookie draft, like just a straight dynasty rookie draft, maybe like the first two rounds. Because it's funny, like during the summer, especially this is your first year playing dynasty, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you learn so much from your first year. You're like, oh, you didn't even, like, know shit when you were doing your first, like, drafts, your first rookie drafts or whatever. Looking back now, I, I think Paris Campbell, like, might be borderline a first-round pick, but might not even fall into the first round anymore because you have the guys that you mentioned, the A.J. Browns, uh, Nikhil Harry, uh, D.K. Metcalf would obviously be up there. The three running backs at this point would probably still be up there. Devin Singletary would have to be a first-round pick. Um, you know, Terry McLaurin, obviously. People saying all those type of guys that already broke out. And, yeah, so like Paris Campbell, obviously just looking at it that way, you know, he's not even, uh, he's barely, if that, even a first round pick um, going back to his rookie class again. But in the beginning of the season, he was a consensus, you know, top eight probably at worst pick. So that's the way I, I like to look at rookies when we're, when we're talking about value moving up and down. 
Yeah, and another rookie that was almost a consensus first-round pick that I want to buy on uh, or buy into is Mikkel Hardman. And I know he was a first-round pick for circumstances that revolved around Tyree Kill's suspension and uh, thoughts that he wouldn't ever play again. But just my only issue with – Just to cut you off, I like this pick because kind of contrary to what I just said about Paris Campbell, how if – someone drafted him they were really excited about him I almost feel like if you drafted Hardman the only reason you did it was on the 50 50 chance that Terry Kill was going to be suspended for the year like almost no one knew anything about Hardman and if you did you probably weren't that high on him because he wasn't like a crazy prospect coming out of college whatsoever the only reason you drafted him was because you thought he was going to take the Tyree Kill role now Tyree Kill is signed and he's going to be there for a while and Nicole Hardman's obviously not getting that role so I think where on the contrary of people really loving their draft pick of Paris Campbell and wanting to hold on to him, you could probably pry away Nicole Hardman pretty cheap. Yeah, that's a great point because you look at what Hardman's done this year. Like they have Sammy Watkins there and I know he's been hurt and he's not the best receiver, but he's obviously running behind him. He's obviously running by, behind Tyreek Hill. But in the situations where Hardman has had a role, he's been productive. I have the splits with and without Tyreek Hill and with and without Sammy Watkins this year, and I'll just read them off to you. With Hill in the uh, lineup, his full season pace is 22 catches, 408 yards, six touchdowns. Without Tyreek Hill, 48 catches, 984 yards, eight touchdowns. And then with Watkins, with him, uh, 23 catches, 530, and seven touchdowns. Without Watkins, 53 catches, 811 yards, and five touchdowns. So basically, when he was called upon, he gave you like wide receiver three, wide receiver two type of numbers with that big play ability to get you those big bonus points. So um, he's a guy who has the speed, and I don't think that like Andy Reid or whatever, whoever decided to trade up to get him in the second round, did so and now think that now thinks that he's a sunk cost just because Tyreek Hill is back I don't think you move up that far in the draft to pick a guy who you only like because he's fast because if you did you could have just waited three rounds four rounds and got our boy Scotty Miller who's another beast but like he's definitely got other things about him in his game we've seen that this year right I know most of his big plays are just due to his speed but if you have an offense led by Patrick Mahomes with Travis Kelsey over the middle and you can boast Tyreek Hill and Miko Harbin on the outside Sure, Miko Hardman probably will never be a top 24 receiver, but he has a potential week after week to give you boom plays. And we've seen that this year, despite him being like the third or fourth option. And even without like Tyreek Hill or Watkins in the lineup, we saw like Demarcus Robinson and Byron Pringle get run. I think as he goes into his second year, um, he's going to learn the NFL a bit more. I mean, he wasn't really asked to do much at Georgia because that school never throws the ball. Um, they rely on the running game year after year with like guys like DeAndre Swift, Nick Chubb, Sony Michelle. You name it, they had it. Um, so I think that second year jump is going to be huge for Michael Hardman. And even into the third year, right? Um, or talking in the second year, Demarcus Robinson's a free agent. But in the third year, um, Sammy Watkins will be a free agent. And the price that he's trying to command or the price that he got already, um, there's no chance that they're going to bring him back. I could see him being the wide receiver two of the Chiefs going forward and tethered to a young quarterback and a great offense with a great offensive mind like uh, Andy Reid, who will probably scheme up plays for him this year because – if you think about it, right, they drafted him thinking that Tyreek Hill probably wasn't going to come back. They gave all his plays that were schemed up for him away to Tyreek Hill. Um, not that they were scheming up plays specifically for him, but that role. Um, now that they know that they have two guys that can fill that role, it's going to be interesting to see what they go, uh, do going forward. And the guy with his draft pedigree and athleticism, I think he could produce going into a second year. Yeah, I mean, a lot to touch on there. Uh, I think most importantly, as you said, Demarcus Robinson is going to be a free agent after this year. I'd be very surprised they brought him back given the draft capital that they just put in Nico Hardman. And when you look at the makeup of this offense, you might be like hesitant to say like, oh, they can't really use Nico and Tyreek Hill as their like wider receiver one and two on the outside like you need one pure possession receiver but you don't not with Patrick Mahomes like this type of offense is just like running guns sling it and they have just because Travis Kelsey has a TE next to his name does not mean he's a legit possession wide receiver one because he is just because he doesn't run his routes on the outside doesn't mean that he can't fill that role plus Tyreek Hill is pretty much every bit the possession wide receiver too so it's not like um, you know, me, wor you worrying about Tyreek Hill and Michael Hardman being the main outside wide receivers should be a thing. So I don't think that's the case. But touching on Sammy Watkins, I mean, that was a fucking egregious contract that they gave him the three years, $48 million. And I'm looking on, by the way, if, uh, if any of you guys want to go check out contracts at any time, uh, the best resource to do that is on spotrack.com. That's S P O T R A C.com. And you could look at uh, all teams, all positions, who's going to be free agents up next year. This is all free. So go check that out. And look at Sammy Watkins. I mean, they already, um, they already took a lot of the hit for his contract, but they're going to take a $21 million cap hit 
if they keep him next year. They're going to lose $7 in dead cap if they release him. So maybe they trade him. Maybe they do release him and save $14 million. That seems like it should be the thing to do, considering he's done fucking absolutely nothing. And Nico Hardman looks like a more explosive, better version of Sammy Watkins at this point. And if that's the case, I mean, it's fucking all systems go for Nico Hardman. Like I said, I mean, people, I mean, dynasty owners like, like players and they dislike players, but most of them aren't going into depth like this research, at, at least not at this point in the season. And especially not for like January, February, March, probably not until about the actual NFL draft. And then you're starting to do more research and being like, Oh, well, which contracts are up, which are not. Nico Hardman seems like a very, very good buy low candidate right now. Um, just based on the makeup of their, uh, the teams and whatnot. Yeah, I was looking at guys that are free agents the same year that Sammy Watkins is, and, like, he's getting paid more than Keenan Allen. It's just, like, I don't understand why they paid him that much or why they thought he was Sammy Watkins of, like, Clemson times, but – It was yeah, just like that. I, I think it was all the – a bunch of wide receivers got – that was the same year that I think Paul Richardson got his big contract. So it was, like, one thing kind of led to another, and they were going off of – I want to say Brandon Cooks' contract maybe, and then, like, the rest of them kind of just spiraled into that. And it's, it's, just, it's just one of those, like, very – like, group type – group think type things where it's, like, a quarterback – one quarterback gets a contract and then just because some guy who's a shittier version of a quarterback is still considered the franchise for another team, he still gets a court, like a, a fucking contract like that. I think it was like during that time period when those things just started to kind of trickle down. But af after we get down with our done with our main guys, we'll jump into uh spot track and start looking at other free agents that are um, going to be done next year and just give very quick thoughts on that. But a couple other like quick hitters that I want to, uh, get off are, are a couple of young tight ends. This dude, Kahali Waring of the Houston Texans. I really, I really, really like this kid. And he's been sitting on my taxi squad for one of my dynasty leagues because he missed his entire rookie season with like a shoulder slash concussion. Um, he, he played none of the regular season. He got put on the IR, the injured reserve, as soon as the season started. I want to say it was like September 3rd of this year. So he missed his entire rookie year, which is huge, um, obviously in his developmental curve. But when you look at the raw profile of him, he is ridiculously athletic, sub 4, 740, and basically 80th percentile or above in all athletic measurables. He's got the size, too. He's not like a 6'3 guy who runs a sub 4, 740. Uh, he is 6'5", 252 pounds, still just 22 years old, producing college, dominator rating in the 61st percentile, broke out in, at the age of 20, so 71st percentile. But he's also tethered to Deshaun Watson. And, you know, you're like, you're thinking Deshaun Watson, and I didn't think he would really rely on tight ends at all this year because that's not what he, is, he had done through uh, his career up to this point. It was more like he's funneled DeAndre Hopkins, funneled to Will Fuller, funneled to whoever's a wide receiver too at this point. But when you look at what Darren Fells and Jordan Aikens have done combined together, and obviously you can't just take their raw numbers and be like, that's what's going to be the tight end going forward because most teams use a combination. But they've produced at a really high level. I mean, when you combine Fells and you combine Aikens, 70 targets on the year, fifth most. If you're just looking at raw tight end numbers, that's fifth most amongst tight ends this year. 53 receptions is tied for sixth most among uh, tight ends this year. 618 yards is the sixth most amongst tight ends this year. Their nine touchdown combined is number one overall among all tight ends. Darren Fells currently right now is tied with Mark Andrews for the NFL lead with seven tight end touchdowns. So those 169 fantasy points combined between Fells and Aikens would be second most among tight ends behind only Kelsey. So clearly it's become a position that Deshaun Watson wants to target. And like I said, this, this kid is a very, very, very athletic. He didn't play a single NFL down this year. So you're really not having to trade anything. He might even, I mean, he probably is not on the wire for you right now, but if he is, I would definitely go pick him up because he'll be back next year. Um, and he's a guy that uh, I, I think has a lot of upside because anytime you can get a kid third round pick. So obviously they like the kid producing college has a lot of explosion to his game. That's the kind of upside I look for in the tight end. So I'm excited to see this kid get back on the field. And uh, if you can swap a fourth round pick for him or even uh, like a player who's worth less than a fourth round pick, he's someone that I would try to get on board with. Yeah, people are typically very impatient when it comes to fantasy football. Like any, even in a dynasty league, if a guy doesn't produce in his first or even his second year, they're just all out on him. Keep in mind, yep. tight ends usually don't produce early on in their careers other than like a few special cases. Cahill Warren could be that type because he lost his whole rookie season due to injury, but he's an athletic freak. I'm pretty sure he's like a former basketball player. So if he ever breaks out, you're going to hear that every Sunday. Um, he's tethered to a really young quarterback who, even if he doesn't break out this year, or maybe he only shows a few flashes next year, he's still tethered to Deshaun Watson. And as long as he takes a few strides this off season going into, you know, 2020 and he, he cements himself as a starter in 2021, that's a huge, you know, you can get a huge return on your investment because 
he could easily be the tight end one in an offense led by a great young quarterback that wants to throw the ball to guys in the red zone. And um, I know De uh, DeAndre Hopkins is getting a bit older. He's still going to be a focal point of that offense. But as you said, like combining those tight end numbers, they obviously want to rely on the tight end. And right now they're just kind of shuffling the deck, going through Darren Fells, Jordan Aikens, Jordan Thomas. If they can have one guy that they can rely on, um, no matter the situation, that's Cahill Warren, you can get a huge return on your investment by sending like a fourth round pick or just a low end uh, player or just adding him into a deal. Yeah, you want to target these really athletic young tight ends who haven't broken out yet because what happens is like Darren Fells is a free agent after this year. So given the fact that they've invested, you know, picks in Jordan Thomas and Aikens and Kahali Warren, like I highly doubt they, they bring him back to, I mean, just, I mean, he has been very successful this year. So I guess it wouldn't be shocking on another like one year deal, but the fact that they've used a lot of capital probably tells you that they wanted to develop some of these young kids. And the problem with like waiting on Kahali Warren is that if he does, you know, secure that like tight end two role or like borderline tight end one role within the offense next year, that's when all the eyes are going to be on him. They're like, oh, this kid's doing pretty well. He's really athletic. We want to buy him now. You're going to have to pay a much more premium price. So you want to look for these athletic tight ends now that have not produced yet, although you still like their profile because you can get them for, for next to nothing. So I like Kali Warren. I also think if we pivot over to the Carolina Panthers, there's two guys I want to buy right now. It's Ian Thomas. Uh, Christian McCaffrey. Yes, I think he's a beautiful buy low candidate. Uh, I think that Ian Thomas is, I, I'm not that excited about him. He's got a great athletic profile, but he's probably been given enough chances to the point where like, he probably should have done a, a little better than he has so far with the opportunities. But I, I'm also going to throw Cam Newton on this list. Yo. He's getting so much like hate, like no one thinks he's going to be back next year. I, I don't see an, a, a chance of him not being the starting quarterback for the Panthers next year. Like they, Kyle Allen is clearly not the long-term option. If Cam Newton is well rested, like he didn't, he's not coming back this year. So he's going to have a year and a half of rest. Like he should be hundred percent going into next year. Nobody wants Cam right now. And I have him in one of my dynasty leagues. I'm happily holding on to him. I would bet money that week one comes next year and Cam is the starting quarterback for the Carolina Panthers. And if he's well rested, like I'm not worried about his health by that point, because I think he'll, he'll be ready to roll and he's going to be Cam Newton. He's going to give you that rushing upside. So, in a super flex league, if you're able to swap, like, I don't know if I want to throw a second rounder out there, but I, I think if I'm going to be bold, I would probably throw a second rounder out there for Cam because I really believe that he is still the quarterback for the Carolina Panthers. Like, you can get cute all you want and be like, yeah, they're going to probably cut Cam. Why the fuck would you cut Cam? Like, what, what are you going to do without Cam Newton on your roster? Like, what, what better option do you have? You know what I mean? Yeah, last year with, like, a bum shoulder during the second half, he was still, like – almost in the MVP conversation, which is kind of crazy to say because Mahomes went for 50 touchdowns, but he was having basically like, he was re basically replicating his 2015 season last season, last year. And now that they have a DJ Moore there, Curtis Samuel, who's kind of broken out and Christian McCaffrey just being this monster, investing a second round pick in a guy who could be surrounded by those weapons um, in a super flex format, that could be huge because if we knew Cam Newton was healthy and going to be the starter next season, it would probably take more than a first round pick to prime away because He's a pretty young guy who has legs that gives you that floor. We've obviously seen the upside out of him. And, yeah, just in the context of that offense, um, I don't see how he wouldn't be valuable if he comes back next year. My only concern is they just fired Ron Rivera, so maybe they're just trying to turn this entire team over and they don't bring him back. But even I, then, I'm, I'm not sure what, that the next – What are they going to do? Are, like, yeah. they ha if they're going into next year without Cam, they're either going to have a rookie quarterback – I mean – they're going to get a middle. Yeah, their next pick. coach is going to be set up for failure if they don't bring back Cam. That's what I mean. Like, if they're going in with Kyle Allen next year, they're going in for basically a fucking tank year, unless you really believe that Kyle Allen's future, because you, you have these young weapons. Like, you have DJ Moore, you have Curtis Samuel, you have Christian McCaffrey. Their offense is set up to win, to produce. So, if you cut Cam Newton, the only argument you can, I mean, the Ron Rivera thing makes sense, but I don't think, like, Ron Rivera is a defensive minded coach. I don't think that that's a huge, uh, you know, hit to Cam Newton. The only thing that would make sense is the contract. Like, his his cap hit next year would be about 21 million and the dead cap would be 2 million if they cut him. So it's a big discrepancy between the numbers, but it just, it just like, I just think it's too cute. Like you people saying, Hey, they're just going to cut him for the money. But like, what, like what are they going to put at the quarterback position if they don't have Cam? like some shitty rookie or Kyle Allen? Like it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And if they cut him, like what team isn't going to go after him if he's healthy? Yeah, like exactly. the Chargers would 100% go. I'm not sure if they can afford him, but if they could, they would definitely go after him because Philip Rivers isn't the answer. And there's a bunch of teams that, are in the same predicament as the Chargers. Yeah, I mean, he's, he, I mean, Cam's obviously like a vet, but he's not out of the, a, a, like, age range. 31, where, it's like, 
Russell Wilson's the same age and 30 right now. Yeah. And Russell Wilson's going to have another seven years of his prime. So it's like, I don't know. I, I, I get that the foot injury is definitely scary, but now the shoulder is going to be completely healed because he's had so much time. As long as the foot heals properly, like we'll be good to go. And I, th- I just think the hate on Cam Newton has gotten to the point where it's like, people are not even being logical with the things they're saying about him. Yeah. And just going back to Ian Thomas, as you brought up, like he hasn't been super productive, but he's still a young tight end in an offense that, Right now, their starter is Greg Olson, who recently just got hurt this past season. And there was talks of him retiring last year. And I think he's only signed for one more season. Um, so, yeah, I don't see him being much of a factor next year because even right now, he just looks like he's hurt out there playing. Ian Thomas last year in those last couple of weeks, um, I'm pretty sure he scored 12 or more fantasy points in three of the last four games of the season when, uh, when Greg Olson was out. I know the first time Greg Olson got hurt last year, he wasn't super productive. But he was a rookie tight end. What could you really expect? The second stint without him, he was very productive. And I know it was a small sample, but – in the games where Greg Olson sat over that second stint, he's on pace for, let me see, 80 catches, 800 yards, and eight touchdowns. So a beautiful, like, aesthetically pleasing stat line. But even then, right, like, the fact that you can trade him for, like, nothing, just a throw-in in a deal, and he has that, like, high tight end two upside. And I know that's not super appealing, but, like, you can't really find young tight ends who have decent enough upside in Dynasty that you can just trade for on the low at this point. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, you, you're just kind of buying into Ian Thomas as as the athletic profile uh, that he has. When you're that young, it's like develop, development hits tight ends at very different ages. So it's like I, I would rather have someone on my bench that has the athletic upside of Ian Thomas that hasn't developed yet than an older guy that we've already seen, you know, just, just not have it anymore. And it's just it's close to retirement or doesn't have the athletic profile and might give you like touchdown dependency every other game or something like that. So I'd rather have him as a stash. I'm going down spot track right now. I'm looking at wide receivers that are going to be uh, unrestricted free agents. And there's honestly not a lot of players that make an impact. Like we have AJ Green's obviously going to be elsewhere, but he's been gone the whole year. So we know what the Bengals makeup is. Larry Fitzgerald is going to be a bunch a of free- older guys this year. I know next year has a bunch of bigger names. Yeah. So, I mean, like Emmanuel Sanders, like none of these guys, like you're not gonna be able to buy Christian Kirk low. You're not gonna be able to buy Debo Samuels low. Uh, Devin Funches has been hurt the whole year. Amari Cooper will get re-signed. Vontae Parker is a restricted free agent, so the team's going to be able to sign him for like five million, which I still am not like buying into the Devontae Parker thing right now, just because he's being funneled an absurd amount of targets. But yeah, there's nothing really that interesting at, at running uh, wide receiver. If we look at the running backs, um, I know you had Duke Johnson listed, so we have Lamar Miller who's going to be a free agent. Carlos Hyde is also going to be a free agent, both unrestricted. So. That does make things interesting for Duke Johnson, but I, I feel like they kind of, if they ever had plans to make him a workhorse, they could have just done it this year. So what I think they're probably going to do is draft someone in this upcoming class that's going to be very strong, probably in the second or third round, and probably ride him. So I'm not necessarily looking to buy into Duke Johnson. Like, do you, do you actually feel like he'd be a good buy right now? I don't know, like looking at their assets this year in the draft, they traded a lot away to get Laramie Tunsil and they only have a second, a fourth, a fifth and a seventh. And they have a lot of problems to address outside of the running back position. I'm sure they could just bring back Carlos Hyde for like some cheap dollar amount because he's not getting paid much right now. Um, But I think that they invest in the O-line. They have a bunch of starters to bring back. I know Bradley Roby and Whitney Merciless. I looked it up. They're going to be free agents next year. They're starters on defense that they're going to have to bring back. So I think they're not going to have enough money to pay like a Melvin Gordon if he goes through free agency and the draft capital that they have only having one second round pick and then not picking again until the fourth. I'm not sure that they're going to waste that pick on a running back when they have Duke Johnson, who they basically spent a third round pick on uh, by trading for him. So I don't think he's ever going to be a workhorse like a lot of people thought he was going to be heading into the year. But I also think that his his snap share could increase to like that 60 percent mark next year because he's hovering around 50 percent and he's been a little inconsistent. But as we said before, being a young player tied to Deshaun Watson and him being involved in the passing game, like getting targets directly from Watson, um, I think could be decent enough upside for him to bring like maybe running back three value next year or like put him in your flex spot. And I, I don't know what his price really is right now because early in the season, people are selling him for like early second round picks, which I think is absolutely astonishing because I never thought he had that upside. But um, he's shown flashes this past week. He did pretty well. So. I think he'd be a decent buy, especially if they don't bring back Lamar Miller, who is on an a, he has an ACL injury, right? He tore his ACL. Yeah, he's done. He's too. Yeah, fun. and Carl's Hyde's a little bit washed, so maybe they turn to Duke Johnson a bit more, who they put some pretty heavy investments into. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting offseason for running backs because all the teams that have like, I mean, semi high powered offenses, Houston, the Chargers, uh, Tampa Bay, like all of their running backs are basically for agents this year, and we have. 
Uh, Peyton Barber is going to be unrestricted. So Ronald Jones could take over the feature role, but again, you're probably not able to buy him low. Frank Gore is an unrestricted free agent. So seems like it's wheels up for Devin Singletary. Again, not going to be able to buy him low. It's going to be interesting. I, I think the two most interesting players this year that are going to be un, uh, are going to be free agents are Derrick Henry and Kareem Hunt. I feel like Derrick Henry probably is going to get a fat fucking contract from the Titans. I mean, like they rode him like not, they rode him like a fucking sea biscuit this year. And he <laughs> deserves, I think he deserves the contract. I, I really do. I think, uh, I think he's still a great sell <laughs> candidate. everywhere. <laughs> That's your redraft leagues, but he's going to take a like a third for him at this point in dynasty. Yeah. If that, I don't know, man, I'm, I'm, I'm out on, I love all the comments we get now about Derek Henry. Like, what about Derek Henry now? Every time I'm just like, sell, still sell. Yeah. I'll admit if I'm wrong, but it's like too funny to admit I'm wrong about Derek Henry. I just like seeing these comments about him. Yeah. I think like even by like week six, we were just jokingly putting on the sell high candidate, but people keep doing it. It's like, yes, we're obviously fucking wrong about Derek Henry. He's running for like 80,000 yards every game, but um, he'll be an unrestricted free agent. I'm assuming he'll get uh, a big contract and then, Kareem Hunt. Now, Kareem Hunt's actually a restricted free agent, which is interesting, but I still think what that means is basically it's a little bit confusing because you could put a first round tender on a player, a second round tender, but that means you would have to give up those picks if you were the one to sign him back. Uh, another team can come in and offer him something and that and the Browns would be able to match that. But again, I've talked about this a few times with Kareem Hunt. Uh, I think he played well enough that a team, again, like we've used this example a million times, is going to give him like a Jarek McKinnon-like contract where it's like three for 30 or whatever. And I highly doubt the Browns are going to match that because they have so much money invested in this offense already. So I'd imagine Kareem Hunt landing elsewhere. Um, I could even see him going to like fucking Miami or something because they're going to be in complete rebuild. And Kareem Hunt is what? It's his second fucking year in the, in the league, right? Or is, is it it's third? It's his third year. I think he's only 25 or he's about to turn 25. We yeah, talked about him last week. But, yeah, I think he's a great buy That's candidate because if somebody is willing to pay him top-tier price where the Browns don't match it, it means that they're paying him to be a workhorse where I think he could be like a top-10 running back in that role. I think it opens up a buy low window for both Hunt and Nick Chubb. Like you're not going to be able to buy them like very low, but you'll be able to get them at a value price because – you know, like you love, you gotta love Nick Chubb in a dynasty league. But he, Hunt has obviously impacted his receiving line a little bit. But once Hunt is gone, I feel like it's going to be what we saw out of Nick Chubb in the first eight games of the year, and it's going to be his backfield to really take over. Um, and they they have to have some sort of a, a different look on offense next year, just because of the shit show that they've had going on this year. So I think Chubb, you know, his value can only go up. I think Kareem Hunt obviously is going to get a contract that warrants work uh, a workhorse kind of role in whatever offense he goes to. Yeah, another running back that's actually a free agent next year that I think is interesting is Kenyon Drake. They obviously just brought him into Arizona. I'm not sure, like, if they bring, if they don't bring him back, are we sure that Chase Edmonds just doesn't have, like, a 60% snap share next year? I know David Johnson has been hurt this season, but for the past two years, he has looked washed, and, like, Cliff Kingsbury has shown, like, no allegiance to him. He's not yeah. going to put him in there just because he's getting paid a lot of money. We've seen that from Kenyon Drake just completely stealing the show. I think next year, if they don't bring back Drake, we could see Chase Edmonds step into a pretty big role in an offense heading into its second year in the league, the second-year quarterback, second-year coach. That's really, like, improved throughout the season. They did very well against San Francisco in both their matchups. And I think if he's the lead back in that offense, um, there's good things to come for Chase Edmonds. Yeah, my only concern with that, uh, similar to what I had with uh, Paris Campbell, is, like, if you have Chase Edmonds on your dynasty league, you're not going to sell him low because you know that, you know that he's, like, you know he's better than David Johnson at this point, and you know that there's a chance that he takes over the workhorse role in that backfield. So if I own him, I'm definitely not, like, trying to sell him low. But if you can throw him into a trade package, like, he's someone that I think you should trade for for value. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at tight ends. There's a couple of interesting names on here. Hunter Henry's an unrestricted free agent, and so is Austin Hooper. Um, I didn't know that that was the – I didn't know that was the case for either of these guys. But I think both of them probably warrant a bigger – uh, contract from their respective teams. Do you think Hunter Henry gets re-signed with the Chargers? Yeah, I think he's going to get re-signed. He's a big part of the offense. He's a great blocker. The team loves him. He's been injured a few times, but every time he's out there, he's heavily involved. I don't see how they don't pay him this season. And if they don't, it's probably just because they can't pay him enough. Yeah, I think uh, that's probably the same case with Austin Hooper having his breakout year. So um, no one else is really that interesting on the tight end um, list. But again, y'all, if you want to go check out the contracts for yourself, Spotrack.com, S-P-O-T-R-A-C.com. That will be linked uh, in the description and in the comment section. And uh, if you want to follow along for a lot of exclusive content like this that will be covering Dynasty throughout the offseason, you can do so by signing up on Patreon, patreon.com slash B-D-G-E, 
where you will get uh, our dynasty rankings updated frequently, plus a lot of behind the scenes uh, content that uh, we don't offer to just anyone except for our most loyal supporters on Patreon. Um, I, I believe that's all we got for today's show. Correct. Yeah. Just remember to submit your lineups and we'll, we'll talk about them next week. Tell you how good you are. Tell you how much you need to change. Yeah. I forgot about that. So if you are a Patreon member, make sure that you uh, post the pictures of your teams and all that kind of stuff. And uh, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you are new, it's another good one. I think we're hitting uh, I think we're hitting our stride with dynasty content right now. Um, so we'll, we'll figure out some more stuff going forward into the off season again. Make sure you're following both of us on Twitter. I am tired. My fucking throat hurts, but we're about to film Fade the Public, so make sure you tune in on Friday for this week's Fade the Public episode. We are out. I'm dead.